This is Harsh Rules, I'm Ben Harsh, and today we're going to learn to play Advanced Squad Leader Starter Kit Number 1. Advanced Squad Leader Starter Kit Number 1 was released in 2004 by Multiman Publishing and Avalon Hill, and designed by Ken Dunn. This game supports two players, and each scenario takes approximately two hours to play. Before we begin this episode, I'd like to recognize the Harsh Rules Patreon supporters that help make content like this possible. If you'd like to support the channel, head over to patreon.com slash harshrules to learn more. And once again, thank you for your support. Welcome back to the Harsh Rules Breakdown for Advanced Squad Leader Starter Kit Number 1. In our last episode, we began the sequence of play with the Rally Phase, and now in this episode, we're going to cover the Prep Fire Phase. So let's jump right in. Let's begin by walking through the process for setting up a fire attack. A fire attack is a unit's primary means of combating an enemy unit. Fire attacks can be conducted by a single unit or a group of units known as a fire group. Typically, a unit may only fire at full strength once per turn. In the prep fire phase, each of these fire attacks will be set up and resolved one at a time. After a fire attack is completed, the participating units are tagged with a prep fire marker to keep track of things. Then, the next fire attack is set up and resolved and so on until the attacker either runs out of units or decides to end the phase. Conducting fire attacks are always at the attacking player's discretion. They may attack with some, all, or none of their units. Next, let's go into a little more detail on setting up a fire attack. First, the attacking player will declare to their opponent the unit or units that will participate in the fire attack and identify the target hex. A fire attack can be conducted by a single unit in a hex or a group of units which comprise a fire group. Units in a fire attack can only be focused on one target hex, and that attack will impact all enemy units within that hex. Be aware that a unit's firepower cannot be divided amongst multiple hexes. There is one exception though, in regards to support weapons. A unit carrying a support weapon can divide their attack. The unit can attack one target hex, and a support weapon like a machine gun can fire on a separate hex. When you want to split the attack between a unit and its support weapon, you'll treat each as a separate fire attack. The squad and the support weapon can be tagged with a prep fire marker separately to keep track of whether they've fired in the turn. Now that you have an idea of how fire attacks work with a single unit and a support weapon, let's talk about fire groups. Two or more units may form a fire group and conduct combined fire attacks. Multiple units in the same hex are automatically fire groups. Therefore, if units in the same hex are going to attack the same enemy unit, they must do so as a fire group and may not make separate attacks unless using a flamethrower or are able to conduct subsequent rate of fire attacks. A fire group may consist of units from more than one hex only if each participating unit occupies a hex in or adjacent to another participating unit of the same fire group. However, a lone leader in a hex cannot be used to link units into a fire group. All members of the fire group must be able to trace a line of sight to the target. A multi-hex fire group that discovers that part of the fire group does not have line of sight to the target forfeits the participation of that unit. Now, we're going to cover line of sight in a moment, but let me clarify this one point. Formally, you cannot check line of sight until you actually conduct the attack. So, when checking each unit's line of sight with a piece of thread, you may find one of those units does not actually have line of sight to the target. In this instance, that unit has essentially wasted their shot. A unit's loss of line of sight does not invalidate the other units it's linked to. The player also has the option to break the linked fire group into separate units and resolve each of their shots as a separate fire attack. Alright then. Once the player has declared the units involved in the fire attack and identified the target hex, it's time to move on to the next step. 
A unit can only hit an enemy unit if it has clear line of sight to it. Line of sight is typically determined by stretching a sewing thread from the center dot of the firing unit's hex to the center dot of the targeted unit's hex. If the path of the sewing thread does not cross an obstacle, such as a building or woods, then the firing unit has clear line of sight. However, if the path of the thread crosses an obstacle, and that obstacle can be seen on both sides of the thread, then line of sight is blocked. Keep in mind though, if the thread touches an obstacle and the obstacle is only visible on one side of the thread, then line of sight is still clear. Some key points to remember when determining line of sight. Obstacle terrain, like woods or buildings, in the firing hex and the target hex do not block line of sight. Think of this as a unit firing from the windows of one building at their target in the windows of another building. Attacks may also be traced through units and intervening hexes without affecting them. In formal play, neither player may make a line of sight check until after an attack has been declared. Should a check reveal a line of sight obstacle, the fire attack is not resolved, but the unit that declared the attack are still considered to have fired. Now that you've declared the firing units and verified they do in fact have line of sight to the target, you're going to need to take some notes. First, check the unit's range to the target. Range may impact a unit's firepower. A unit's normal range is the center number at the bottom of the counter. In this example, the German squad has a range of six hexes. Keep in mind though, if an enemy target is adjacent to their position, then it's subject to point-blank fire, and the firepower is doubled. Now, although our German unit has a normal range of six hexes, its long-range firing ability is double this. Firepower above normal range, though, is halved. Now that we know any firepower impacts from the target's range, we need to identify any terrain hindrance on the path to the target hex, and any terrain that might be providing cover. First, let's discuss hindrance. Some terrain, such as orchards, grain fields, and ones covered in smoke, do not completely block line of sight. Instead, these terrain hexes' partial visibility hinders fire attacks traced through it. Each instance of hindrance, from orchards or grain fields when they're in season, add one die roll modifier to any infantry fire table die roll. Smoke adds a two die roll modifier, and it stacks with any other hindrance terrain. So smoke across an orchard would make the hex plus three die roll modifier, and so on. However, tracing line of sight through multiple hindrance hexes can eventually block a shot. Any combination of terrain hindrance die roll modifiers greater than or equal to plus six blocks line of sight completely. Now, once you've made a note of any terrain hindrance that may be in effect, it's time to check to see if the target has the advantage of any cover. What we think of cover is referred to an advanced squad leader as a terrain effect modifier, or a TEM. The starter kit has three types, woods, wood buildings, and stone buildings. Each provide a terrain effect modifier that will negatively impact the attacker's dice roll. And now that we've declared our firing unit, verified our line of sight, checked for any range modifications to firepower, and identified any hindrance and terrain effect modifiers, we're ready to resolve our attack. Fire attacks are resolved on the infantry fire table. This table has two axes. Let's first look at the vertical axes for firepower. At the top of each column is a number that maps to a unit or fire group's firepower rating. With a fire group, add the firepower of all participants together to find the correct column. You'll notice that not all firepower ratings have a column on the table. For example, if the firepower rating is seven, there is no column for this. For these instances, you use the column that does not exceed the firepower. Therefore, for a firepower of seven, you would use the six column. Now, remember I told you to take notes on range to target? This is where you'll need to use them. If the target was within point blank firing range, double the firepower. So in our example on the screen, 
the German squad's firepower of 4 within point-blank firing range would become 8. However, if the target was at long range, have the firepower. So at long range, the German squad's firepower would be halved from 4 to a 2. When reducing firepower of odd numbers, like 5, you're going to get fractions. Be aware that fractions of halved firepower are not dropped, but retained for further modification or added to the firepower totals of other units involved in an attack. Next, the player is going to roll two dice, a red one and a white one. If the dice result is an original double, which are the numbers on the dice without modifiers, then the firing unit has cowered. Cowering is one of the more board gamey elements of Advanced Squad Leader. It means the unit is not confident in making their attack, and as a result suffers a firepower penalty. However, cowering does not occur if the unit is stacked with a leader. Cowering penalties for elite, first line, and second line class units reduce the firepower rating by one column. For inexperienced units of a green or convict class, reduce the firepower rating by two columns. If cowering adjusts the unit's firepower off the chart, then the attack has no effect. Once you've adjusted the attack for any cowering effects, it's time to move over to the horizontal axis, which is for the modified dice roll. Ultimately, the attacking player wants the lowest dice total to get the best result on the table. Good modifiers reduce the dice total. Bad modifiers increase the dice total. Once the dice is rolled, you can follow the row until it intersects with the firepower column. This is the dice result before we apply any modifiers. Now, I've purposely selected 7 as the dice result to illustrate a key point. Whenever you roll two six-sided dice, the most likely number to be rolled is 7. You'll also notice that the 7 row cuts across the center of the infantry fire table. ASL players use the rule of 7 to gauge risk. Right now, the German squad has a firepower of 4. With the rule of 7, you can see we're right in the middle between the printed results and the dashes. Now watch what happens when we add the modifiers. In our example, we have a plus 1 for orchard for hindrance and a plus 1 because the target is in woods. We would then add 2 to our dice roll to get our final result on the table. The modified dice result is a 9, which is also the most likely number to be rolled with a plus 2 modifier. So using the rule of 7 combined with the firepower and the modifiers, you can get a sense of how risky the shot is. Keep the rule of 7 in mind when planning your own fire attacks. Now, our German squad did not fare so well in its fire attack. However, in the next episode of this rules breakdown, we're going to take a look at what could have happened by reviewing all the outcomes on the infantry fire table. So make sure you're subscribed to the channel and ring the bell icon for notifications so you'll know when the next episode becomes available. If you found this video helpful, please give me a like and share with your friends. To be the first notified when the next episode of Harsh Rules becomes available, please hit the bell icon for notifications. And as always, this has been Harsh for Harsh Rules. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you on the next video.